Love what you hear? Be sure to check us out on Patreon at patreon.com slash finish the fight for exclusive episodes, insights, and even our D&D adventure. If you're an athlete, you know the greatest motivator of all is the fear of letting your teammates down. After all, a team is only as good as its weakest link. So you owe it to those wearing the same jersey as you to be your best every time you step on the field. That's why there's no vape in team. When you vape, you can expose your lungs to toxic chemicals that can damage your lungs. If you're a step behind, the team's a step behind. Brought to you by The Real Cost and the FDA. Welcome back to Finish the Fight, a gaming podcast. Where we produce and develop the highest quality gaming research in podcast form. I am your host, Alex Kendall. And I am your host, Derek Baker. And today we are talking about a Sony certified classic. That's apparently what I say they're called. (laughs) And we're talking about a game that really set off the platforming era and also the mascot era of Sony, trying to decide, ooh, who should it be? Who should represent our console among the plethora of beautiful characters? Listen, it should have been Glover, but I digress. Today we're going to be talking about Spyro the Dragon. Yeah, I mean, when you're trying to find a flagship character, why just make one when you can make like 75 of them? And then one of them's got to exactly. stick, right? And then just, they never really stopped doing that. Now that I think about it, it's like they got Sackboy, you know, they're, they're still like experimenting with some of that flagshipness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They've got the little Astro guy too. I mean, even Kratos that has kind of come up to be a character that we're seeing on, you know, Sony specific. That's true. I did see him in an ad on my TV. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, Love Spyro. Spyro was everywhere, and Spyro reminds me a lot of childhood. I mean, he really was just plastered everywhere. There's him, there's Crash Bandicoot, of course there's Mario, and there's all those games. But when I think about game-specific characters, Spyro is definitely up there as, I think, one of the OGs, and he's kind of fallen off as well. He doesn't have that same power that I think that he did back then, but absolutely a staple of the childhood. And as always, excited to talk about this little purple guy. Exactly. And I want to jump in real quick and talk slightly about Insomniac, who, who was the creator of Spyro at the time, and really pushed the limits and the limitations that the uh, Sony's PlayStation had. You know, we've seen them throughout the years, and most recently, I think all of you would probably know them from either the Ratchet and Clank reboot, or probably more so from the Spider-Mans. So Spider-Man, Spider-Man, Miles Morales, and even Spider-Man 2. Um, All worked on by Insomniac, but let's jump back to 1998 when we had the release of Spyro the Dragon, which, as we know, is an action-adventure game developed by Insomniac Games and published by Sony Computer Entertainment for the PlayStation. The first game in the Spyro series, it stars the title character, a young purple dragon named Spyro, and his dragonfly friend, Sparks, who must journey across the Dragon Kingdom to defeat Nasty Nork who has overtaken the five dragon home worlds by trapping the other dragons in crystal and turning their horde of gems into an army of minions. Spyro the Dragon is an open-ended 3D platformer featuring large, sprawling levels in which the player must locate collectible items, among which are gemstones, crystallized dragons, and stolen dragon eggs. Spyro's abilities as a dragon include fire breath, a head-on charging attack, and a mid-air glide which he can use to scale large distances, all of which must be used strategically to find items and defeat enemies. Spyro the Dragon started development following the release of Insomniac's debut game, Disruptor, which sold poorly but was generally praised by critics, impressing Universal Interactive enough to encourage them to make a second game. Artist Craig Stitt suggested a game about a dragon, and work began on a new game. Taking inspiration from the film Dragon Heart, the game started out as a more mature title with a dark and realistic approach, but the direction was shifted to have a more whimsical and lighthearted tone to appeal to a wider market of consumers. The game was one of the first on the PlayStation to utilize shifting levels of detail among rendered objects, 
thanks to a panoramic engine developed by Alex Hastings, which allowed the game's open-ended nature to be fully realized. Stuart Copeland, the former drummer for the police, composed the game's music, and the titular character was voiced by actor Carlos Alizacri, alongside additional voices done by Clancy Brown, Michael Gauch, and Jamie Allcroft. Spyro the Dragon was released by Sony Computer Entertainment as part of a general effort to reach out to a younger age demographic and compete with the more popular kids' platform, the Nintendo 64. Although sales were initially sluggish, it found larger success following the advent of the 1998 holiday season and went on to sell nearly 5 million copies worldwide. Critics praised the game's graphics and gameplay, while some noted its low difficulty level. The game established Spyro as a well-known platforming mascot on the PlayStation, alongside Crash Bandicoot and two sequels titled Spyro 2, Ripto's Rage, and Spyro, Year of the Dragon, were later released for the PlayStation in 1999 and 2000, respectively. Although Insomniac gave up the development rights to the Spyro series following the third game, the success of the PlayStation titles lent itself to a continued series of games across various platforms. The game, alongside its two successors, was later remade as part of Spyro Reignited Trilogy in 2018. And so let's talk a little bit about Insomniac. And Insomniac Games was founded by Ted Price, who was determined to work in the video game industry since the release of Atari 2600 in 1977, when he was just nine years old. The company was incorporated on February 28, 1994. Price was joined by Alex Hastings, his fellow graduate and an expert in computer programming. In June 1994, Hastings' brother Brian joined Insomniac shortly afterwards. The studio was named Extreme Software for a year, but in 1995, it was forced to rename itself by another company with the same name. The studio shortlisted The Resistance Incorporated, Ragnarok, Black Sun Software, Ice Nine, and Moon Turtle before choosing the name Insomniac Games. According to Price, the company chose this name because it suddenly makes sense, even though it was not their first choice. Shortly after the company's establishment, it began developing its first project. The team took inspiration from the popular Doom and hoped to capitalize upon the industry's excitement for a first-person shooter. The team lacked experience and considered developing a Doom clone. The game was developed for Panasonic 3DO because its development kit was inexpensive and the team had high hopes for the console. Using a time frame of one month, the team developed a functional gameplay demo for the game. It was pitched to various publishers and was later shown to Mark Cerny, an executive producer for Universal Interactive Studios, who is impressed by the team's efforts. Universal published the game and helped with funding and marketing. Universal helped the game's development and cutscenes and hired actors to film real-time sequences. Catherine Hardwick was hired to lead production design, and inspirations were taken from Warhawk. Cerny gave input and feedback on the game's level design. However, as we all know, The 3DO did not perform as they had expected, and Universal suggested that the team should switch to Sony Computer Entertainment's PlayStation to increase sales of the game. The game originally ran on a custom engine developed by Alex Hastings, and was upgraded and converted for the PlayStation within a month. And like I said, that debut title was called Disruptor, and was released worldwide in November of 1996. Disruptor was released to positive critical reception, it was named Dark Horse of the Year by various gaming publications. John Romero, founder of Doom developer id Software, praised the game. Insomniac considered Disruptor a lesson about video game development. According to Price, it was, quote, the best game that nobody ever heard of. With little marketing and advertising, the game was a commercial failure for Insomniac. Despite the game's poor performance, Universal continued to partner with Insomniac for its next game. The team's morale was low, and they decided to develop something new instead of a sequel to Disruptor. At that time, the demographic for the PlayStation shifted, as more children and teenagers started to use the console. As a result, the team decided not to make another violent game like Disruptor and instead develop a family-friendly game 
that would be suitable for every member of a family, regardless of their age. The family game market was dominated by Sony's competitor Nintendo, with games like Super Mario 64, while the PlayStation had no similar exclusives. Cerny pushed Insomniac Games to develop a game with a mascot and mass appeal. Craig Stitt, an environment artist of Disruptor, proposed that the game's theme and story should revolve around an anthropomorphic dragon. At the same time, Alex Hastings began developing an engine that specialized in games with panoramic views, which was suitable for open-world games. The engine allowed more gameplay features, including the ability for the dragon to glide through air. Spyro the Dragon was released in late 1998. Now, as we know, it was built up as this kind of like very dark and gritty gameplay until, as Derek had said, like they needed something to compete with the N64. I mean, it was dominating that younger market. And so as they started to build this up, they needed to get ideas of what to do. So according to programmer Pete Hastings, the dragon character was originally going to be named Pete. But as we all love, you know, Pete's dragon. It was unfortunately nixed due to copyright concerns over those similarities to Disney's film Pete's Dragon. They ended up scrapping the name. After considering the name Pyro, which was ultimately considered too mature, they settled on Spyro. In-game dialogue was written by Peter Kleiner, and Spyro's character was designed by Charles Zambilas, who had previously done design work on Crash Bandicoot. Spyro was originally going to be green, but the developers worried he would kind of blend in with the grass, so they eventually changed him to purple. During development of Spyro, Insomniac had a very close relationship with Crash Bandicoot creator and fellow PlayStation developer Naughty Dog, who had their office located directly across the hall from theirs. The two developers frequently worked together, playing early builds of each other's games and later sharing game technology. As a result, a demo of Crash Bandicoot warped was hidden in Spyro, and vice versa. Spyro the Dragon was unique compared to other 3D platform games of the time. Spyro's ability to glide allowed him to travel long distances in the air, meaning the player could cross almost an entire level if starting from a high enough point. While this made designing levels more difficult for the team, it also meant that levels could be made more open-ended and exploratory in nature. To make Spyro's controls feel fluid, Matt Whitting, a NASA engineer who specialized in flight controls, was brought on to help with programming camera movement as well as Spyro's movement controls. The game's camera was particularly challenging. Initially, it always followed directly behind Spyro, but the resulting high-speed movements were found to make several playtesters feel nauseous. This was most evident with Spyro's basic jump, which triggered the camera to quickly tilt up and down, compared by Whitting to the motion of a rocking boat. This was ultimately tweaked so that the camera would stay steady. Spyro was coded with efficiency in mind, as 3D rendering technology was new at the time and the game had to fit with limited specifications of the PlayStation. Around 80% of the game's code was written using assembly, while other parts were programmed in C due to its simplicity and speed. Spyro the Dragon made use of a 3D panoramic engine developed by Alex Hastings that could display faraway objects by utilizing varying levels of detail, a method of rendering which was new and unexplored at the time. The developers believed that the engine would be fitting for the game as it could allow for more expansive levels that could take advantage of the character's abilities, such as gliding. This dynamic system, used to complement the large and sprawling environments, generated two different versions of a level. One version rendered in high detail, and the other a simpler, textureless render. Objects in the player's vicinity were drawn using the detailed render, whereas distant ones were drawn from the simple render. This system allowed objects to be displayed from far distances while adhering to the PlayStation's limited RAM capabilities. It was one of the first video games to make use of such a system. The game made extensive use of vertex shading to color objects and provide light and shade, with the smooth skies entirely reliant on the technique to depict clouds and other distant details without the use of textures. Base textures were intentionally kept relatively desaturated 
so as to prevent them from becoming oversaturated with use of the technique. And so with that, let's move over to the gameplay. Spyro the Dragon is a 3D action-adventure game, as we said, where the player controls the titular character as he ventures across the realms of the dragon world to defeat the antagonistic Nasty Nork, as well as rescue his fellow dragons and recover all of their stolen treasure. Worlds consist of six dragon homeworlds, each of which acts as a dedicated hub, containing portals that serve as gateways to different levels. The player must progress from one homeworld to the next by talking to a balloonist, who transports Spyro to the next world on a hot air balloon after the player has found the required collectibles in the current given world. In addition to regular platforming stages, each homeworld contains a boss fight and a hidden flight stage that involves flying throughout an environment and destroying a number of objects. The levels in Spyro the Dragon are open-ended, and they revolve around exploring and obtaining various collectible items to progress in the game. Each stage contains a number of crystallized dragons, whom Spyro must turn back to normal by locating and stepping on their statue bases. These dragons give the player advice on how to progress through the game, as well as their respective locations acting as save points after the dragon has been freed. Another important collectible in the game is the Dragon Stolen Treasure, which is dispersed throughout each level in the form of multicolored gemstones. These gems are located in numerous different places, including inside enemies, breakable boxes, and treasure chests, and most stages contain a set number of treasure to be found. There are also stolen dragon eggs that must be reclaimed by chasing and defeating thieves. Finding every collectible in the game unlocks an additional world that otherwise cannot be accessed. Spyro has two main offensive moves, which are used to attack enemies as well as destroy certain objects. You have charging, in which Spyro sprints forward and rams into things with his head, and breathing fire. These attacks must be used appropriately for certain enemies and situations. For instance, some enemies carry fireproof metal armor, meaning that they can only be defeated by charging, while larger enemies can only be hit using fire breath, as they will immediately crush Spyro otherwise. Spyro can also use his wings to glide in midair, letting him travel further distances in the air and access areas otherwise unreachable via a regular jump. Throughout the game, Spyro is accompanied by Sparks, a yellow dragonfly who protects Spyro from taking damage and serves as the player's system of health. Sparks' current health is represented by the color of his body. If Spyro is hurt by an obstacle, such as an enemy or by touching water, Sparks changes colors, with yellow, blue, and green representing different subsequent amounts of withheld damage. If the player is damaged too many times, Sparks disappears, leaving Spyro vulnerable to losing a life if he is hurt again. Sparks can be rejuvenated by consuming butterflies, which are found by killing passive creatures such as sheep that roam throughout most levels. Sparks also helps Spyro collect items by retrieving any gems that Spyro passes. And as it is with a lot of the early games, there's a story, albeit a little bit of a small one, to justify the gameplay that follows. And in the world of dragons, the dragon kingdom consists of five homeworlds. The artisans, the peacekeepers, the magic crafters, the beast makers, and the dream weavers, which have lived in harmony for many years. One day, a TV interview with a pair of dragons from the Artisan Realm catches the attention of Nasty Nork, a powerful Nork, which is half gnome and half orc, who was banished from the kingdom due to his abrasive demeanor and sent to an abandoned junkyard, which he renamed to Nasty's World. After hearing one of the dragons in the broadcast openly dismiss him as being simple-minded, not a threat, and calling him ugly, Nasty Nork loses his temper and unleashes a full-fledged attack on the kingdom. Using his magic, he casts a spell across the land that encases every dragon in a crystal shell. He also steals the dragon's prized collection of treasure, turning the gemstones into devious Nork soldiers and other creatures to help him take over the dragon worlds. Spyro, a young purple dragon, is the only dragon that manages to avoid getting crystallized by the attack. Aided by his dragonfly companion, Sparks, Spyro eagerly sets out to locate and defeat Nasty Nork. Spyro visits each of the dragon homeworlds, defeating Nork's forces who have been set out to stop him. 
Along the way, he frees the crystallized dragons, who give him advice and urge him to recover any stolen treasure and dragon eggs along the way. He eventually makes his way to Nasty's world, where he finally confronts and defeats Nasty Nork. After Spyro's quest is over, he has access to Nork's treasure portal, which can only be opened if Spyro rescues every dragon in the kingdom and recovers all of the dragon's treasure and retrieves the stolen dragon eggs. A secret ending can then be unlocked by retrieving everything inside of the treasure portal. In this ending, Spyro is seen getting interviewed on TV when another spell is placed on the dragons, prompting Spyro to set out on yet another adventure. And thus, continuing the Spyro cycle. Next up, let's talk about the music and sound. The game's music was composed and produced by Stuart Copeland, formerly the drummer for the British band The Police. Copeland was given early builds of the game's levels, which he played through to get a feel for them and come up with a fitting composition. He was also given game cheats, such as invincibility, so that he could have an easier time clearing levels. Copeland wrote four songs per day, all of which he further developed and polished the next day. According to Copeland, each song in the game was written to correspond to a specific level, but this correlation ultimately went unused. Copeland has looked back positively on his work on Spyro, calling the game's music some of his best compositions. Carlos Elizaque provided the voice of Spyro in the game, and additional voices were done by Clancy Brown, Michael Gao, Jamie Alcroft, and Michael Connor. Alizakwe explained in an issue of Electronic Gaming Monthly that he tried to make Spyro's voice sound like a kid at camp that everybody likes. He did not use or continue his role after the first game, being replaced by Tom Kenny for the sequels instead. Spyro the Dragon was first unveiled at the 1998 E3 convention in Atlanta, Georgia. It was then later released in North America on September 9, 1998, and in Europe in October of the same year. According to Sony Computer Entertainment's American Marketing Vice President, Andrew House, at a press party in Las Vegas, the game, along with other upcoming fourth-quarter PlayStation releases, such as Crash Bandicoot, Warped, A Bug's Life, and Rugrats Search for Reptar, was part of a general effort to appeal to a wider demographic of younger audiences and provide more games suited for younger players to compete with the Nintendo 64, which had a far larger library of children's titles at the time compared to the PlayStation's largely adult-centric demographic. An advertisement campaign was pushed to promote the game, featuring a character from the game, Toasty the Sheep, protesting against the title character's actions against sheep. The campaign included TV commercials featuring an actor in an animatronic costume of Toasty and a promotional website, SheepAgainstSpyro.com. On August 16, 1999, SCEA announced that the game would be included as part of their greatest hits lineup of budgeted releases alongside other games such as Crash Bandicoot Warped, Gran Turismo, Cool Borders 3, and Twisted Metal 3 and alongside the announcement of a price drop for the PlayStation console to compete with the highly anticipated launch of the Sega Dreamcast. On December 12, 2012, the game was digitally re-released to the PlayStation Store together with Spyro 2 Ripto's Rage and Spyro Year of the Dragon. A remake of the game, alongside its two sequels, was included as a part of the Spyro Reignited Trilogy compilation for the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One in November 2018 followed by the Nintendo Switch and Microsoft Windows in September 2019. The popularity of Spyro the Dragon helped to push the character of Spyro as a popular platforming mascot for the PlayStation alongside Crash Bandicoot. It was the first game in what became an expansive video game series, spawning two more platforming sequels for the PlayStation, which are Ripto's Rage and Year of the Dragon, released in 99 and 2000 respectively. As of the year 2000, the series had sold more than 3.2 million copies in the U.S. and over 4 million copies worldwide. Insomniac stopped developing the Spyro series after Year of the Dragon, as it finished off their four-game contract with Universal Interactive. Despite this, the series was continued across various different developers and shifted to several other platforms besides PlayStation. Spyro being their first considerable success, 
Insomniac went on to develop several other successful video game franchises, including the Ratchet and Clank series of platform games and the first-person shooter series Resistance. The game's rendering system, new and unheard of at the time, has gone on to be used in several other 3D video games. And Derek, I just want to jump in now and say that I did look it up, and SheepAgainstSpyro.com is available. Well, it's no longer available now because I just bought it, but <laughs> it was available <laughs> at the time. Great. Oh, take that. Because we, Take it, that, 1998. Listen, <laughs> We know how important this is to Sony to keep, so I made sure to sit on this. So when Sony comes a begging again, I'm going to go ahead and sell this back for the big bucks. I can't wait to read the article about <laughs> you holding this hostage. Listen, it had to be done. From that, from that <laughs> retro 90s uh, sheep marketing campaign, big sheep's going to come for you. Big sheep's coming back for me, baby. And listen, you know the reason why? It's because according to Spyro's developers, sales were initially slow at the game's launch, but quickly began picking up following their holiday season. In the week of November 29th, 1998, it was the third best-selling game in the UK behind Tomb Raider and FIFA 99. At the 1999 Mila Festival in Cannes, it took home a gold prize for revenues above 20 million euro in the European Union during the previous year. Spyro the Dragon received a gold award from the Verband de Utenhaltung <laughs> Software Deutschland, or the VUD. We get that every time, and I pronounce it correctly, 100%. Absolutely. <laughs> and so that was by the end of August 1999, for sales of at least 100,000 units across Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. By December of 99, the game had sold 1 million copies in North America, and as of 2007, the title had gone on to sell a total of nearly 5 million units. Spyro the Dragon currently holds a score of 85% at game rankings, based on several reviews. IGN's Craig Harris hailed it as the most fun 3D platformer he had played since Crash Bandicoot, writing, Two claws up, way up. Computer and video games called the game easily the best 3D platform game on the PlayStation, despite noting its largely child-friendly nature. Sean Smith of Electronic Gaming Monthly wrote that Spyro is to the PlayStation what Banjo-Kazooie is to the N64, and stated that it combines the two most important aspects in any good game, graphics and gameplay. Crispin Boyer, also for EGM, proclaimed that Spyro raises the bar for 3D platformers and wrote that it had replaced Gex 3D, Enter the Gecko, as his favorite PS mascot game. Joe Fielder of GameSpot called the game a proficient, fully 3D platform game for the PlayStation, comparing it favorably to one of the most recent platformers on the system, Blasto, and proclaiming that it excels over Blasto in every way imaginable, and I fully agree because I've never heard of Blasto. Despite this, he wrote that the game only gets very, very high marks instead of outrageously high marks, citing its lack of high difficulty as the main factor that made it inferior to games like Super Mario 64 and Banjo-Kazooie. Edge named it the best 3D platform game for the PlayStation, but criticized Spyro's limited abilities and said that the game was not as varied as Super Mario 64. If you Google Blasto, you will just get hit with a wave of like 90s nostalgia that you didn't know that you had in your mind, but it's there. I promise it's there. Oh, Blasto is a game. You are not wrong. <laughs> it's like uh, Johnny Bravo, the superhero. Yes, 100%. I just saw that. 100%. GamePro reviewer, codename Slow Mo wrote that the game's graphics and animations gave Spyro the look and feel of an animated film while calling the in-game environments breathtaking. Harris wrote that the game utilizes the PlayStation's hardware to the max and praised the quality of the in-game animations. He particularly praised the rescued dragon's talking animations, which he said gave the characters incredible personality. Fielder praised the game's dynamic lighting system and character designs and noted a near-complete lack of pop-up during gameplay. 
Someone with the code name Sushi X of Electronic Gaming Monthly said that the graphics were among the finest on the PlayStation. Fielder spoke positively of Copeland's compositional work, calling it wonderfully atmospheric. Slow Mo described the music as having a catchy, mellow jazz rock swing to it, while also praising the work for its wide array of unique voices. Many critics held praise for the game's level design and controls, though some noted its simplicity and low difficulty level, with the exception of treetops. Fielder called the level design exceptional, while Boyer praised the levels for encouraging exploration among players. Sushi X called the play controls perfectly tuned, while Fielder wrote that they worked well both with and without the DualShock's analog stick, although Smith expressed that controls were unsuited for maneuvering in high-risk areas. The camera system received varying reactions, with Boyer praising it as one of the best in any 3D platformer and Fielder declaring that it fixed the common issues present in most other 3D platform games. While Harris criticized its lack of precision when following the player, stating that it tends to float around on a loose tether, and highlighted the camera system as one of the game's only flaws. Fielder wrote that an overabundance of extra lives caused the game to feel like it was aimed at a younger or broader audience, holding the final boss and the bonus level as the only exceptions. Despite praising Spyro, Sushi X noted the game's lack of diversity in obstacles and objects leading to repetitive play. Boyer lamented that the common trope of collecting items, while still very fun in Spyro, was starting to become less interesting, while also criticizing the game's boss fights, calling them small, easy, and decidedly unboss like And you know what? That comment to me is very unboss like <laughs> A true boss would appreciate Spyro for what it's worth. And that's what we're going to talk about now. It's just the reason why we chose Spyro in this. We know it's a classic game. We know it came out on the PlayStation and kind of fought tooth and nail against Crash to kind of see what was the mascot of the time. And I do love that idea that Naughty Dog was right across the hallway from them. And both studios have gone on to be huge powerhouses, huge, huge powerhouses, especially when we're talking Sony and basically owe kind of everything to these two studios <laughs> as to oh, kind yeah. of why they're still around is pretty much Insomniac and Naughty Dog. And then you also have, you know, Sony's experimental studios of like Santa Monica that did God of War and then plenty of other titles that they're working on. But it is crazy to see just how much influence these two companies had on Sony's success over the next, I guess in 98, we're talking 25 years. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. Absolutely. And you know, PlayStation, uh, they might have been around without these two studios because the PlayStation 2 accepted literally every type of developer's content that it possibly mm -hmm. could with like the most wide game library of all time. But these two definitely, I think, help to build that brand, make the PlayStation feel like a special console. And that's, I think, really key for the home console market. Um, without that, without Master Chief, is Xbox successful? No, not really. And now, you know, we see some of the struggles that they've had since they haven't really been adding in those new, more exciting characters mm -hmm. and things like that, where they, they had a lot of success from that in the 2000s. And then, of course, Nintendo has Mario and Sony has 75 mascots, whatever, but they're recognizable, right? Like, you know Spyro belongs really at home with them. You know Crash Bandicoot makes you think of Sony as well. And then, yeah, they have the New Age ones where I think they kind of went back to that more adult target market, which I think was the mm -hmm. right decision because they've put out some really spectacular games um, for the PlayStation. I mean, I, I definitely am, am a huge fan and have been a huge fan since, I think, the PlayStation 4 being the turning point. But... I digress, yeah. getting off on a tangent. 
Spyro, really cool. And like I said, just reminds me of the 90s. Just reminds me of childhood. Just reminds me of that same transitionary period where we have these good platformer games coming out that have a little bit of a charm, but they're also they're moving into that new age. They still are holding on a little bit of that arcade style. They don't 100% know how to move on from that. And we see that in the reviews where they're saying, hey, collecting items is great, but it's a little stale. We're getting tired of it. And I think that's totally fair because so many games for that long, long time were just solely focused on collecting items, essentially. Yeah, and I 100% agree with you. I think that relationship with Naughty Dog was really cool. And who knows what type of influence these two had on each other's games without being there. It's hard to say, but just those little moments of being able to play test for each other, you know, especially when you've got two quality teams that are willing to work together, even though they're a little bit of competition, like, you know, the success. If, if one of these mascots took off for the PlayStation, Who's to say that the other one, you know, might not be as important to the company anymore? So I thought that that was really cool. And there were some things about the development of this game that I guess I didn't realize that I found interesting. I think the rendering process Mm -hmm. is such a staple of so many video games that was really just being built out, you know, when this game was released and to develop that system where those objects are in the distance, you know there's something there and you can target it, but the full detail doesn't come in until later. It's just such a smart way to allow you to, I think, truly adventure and feel like there's this bigger world that exists instead of all this blank space well, yeah, it, that I think existed in a lot of those old games where you might get to the edge and it feels like falling off a cliff. Well, and you can thank both Insomniac and Naughty Dog for pushing... Sony to make a better console. I mean, it took Naughty Dog making Crash to basically hack into the PlayStation to reclaim memory just from the console unit itself to make Crash work. And then Spyro being like, hey, your console kind of sucks in terms of developing for it. You don't have enough RAM. You don't have enough of this stuff. So we're going to have to get creative and make our own engine that works with your console. And Sony took both of those kind of like ideas and concepts of it and it's like okay the the ps2 has to be better it has to be a more powerful console was it easier to develop for no and you still hear some of those great stories of how sony has always made like the hardest console to develop for in those terms but it definitely pushed sony to be like okay listen come under our wings we will fund anything that you do just make some cool things for us and that's basically really what got them on the map and what brought and like it's still amazing to think at the time of like, because we had talked when we, before we recorded, like, wasn't the spot, wasn't that early in the 90s? Because they spread those out. It's like, no, it was 90, 98, 99, 2000. That was the three Spyros that came out. It was one a year. They just cranked them out. And it's amazing to see how that, you know, development works. And then if anyone's played the uh, new re release, the Reignited, it feels so comfy on the switch and these other systems and just see like even with this you know upgrades to it has this still core gameplay is revitalized and still lives in 25 years from then and and it's cool to see that they made such a long lasting platform game that overall is fun and does still have like you said the mechanics of having to collect a lot of things and if you're not into that doing like a 100% style game maybe you just kind of ignore that and you're like hey don't need the true ending, but if you enjoy going back and be like, ooh, where's that gem? Where's that dragon egg? Did I miss one of these, you know, crystallized dragons? I can go back into these levels, get those 100%, or even try and speed run it. And it's such a fun era of gaming to have variety, I guess is a word with it, but have that like core gameplay mechanic that's just so much fun in that era. It is the Banjo-Kazooie. It is all of those, I guess, anthropomorphic kind of animals that you just collect a bunch of stuff and then fight a magician basically but it's fun yeah you you fight a wizard yeah and because wizard's fun to say and so that's why we did it that was the 90s <laughs> exactly i mean yeah absolutely and <laughs> that core gameplay in its simplicity i mean it's just it's so nostalgic for mm-hmm. me so many things about spyro even if 
Spyro wasn't necessarily my favorite platformer from that era. I love Super Mario 64. I think it's one of the best games ever made. You know, but there's just so many things to look back on fondly within that era of gaming. The collectibles were just so important, I think, for longevity. Now Mm -hmm. you have these games where it might have a collectible system. Assassin's Creed is big on the collectibles and things like that. And if you want to do that, you can, but it's more story centric. That's the era of gaming that we're in now. It's a it's a big visual, beautiful narrative. And yeah, the gameplay is really great and superior as well. But it's so important to just have this great overarching story in a lot of the AAA video games, as opposed to when Spyro was released. And, you know, there's games like uh, in the Tomb Raider episode, we talked about, you know, the little secret things that you can find in that too, in, in every, every level. And that is just their way of giving you replayability essentially, where it's that extra challenge is really just going and finding these little things. And so they weren't necessarily doing anything wrong, I think, by adding that in there and making that such an important part of the gameplay. It was just so commonplace for so many different games when this came out. And I think overall, they had a really good mindset going into making Spyro because They knew that they wanted to make a game for kids. They knew how to set the levels to not be too difficult. Mm -hmm. They knew that there had to be more marketing because their last game was such a failure because of the lack of marketing, despite how good they made it. So just, I think, being really on point and targeting and saying, these are going to be key points of emphasis for us are what ultimately led to Spyro's success And still to this day and forever always, even if there's not a brand new Spyro game coming out, if I see Spyro, I think of that era. And that's a really cool thing, I think. And I I don't know, if that were me, I would be super happy with that result Mm -hmm. to have built a very recognizable character like that. Well, absolutely. I I think after all this, as we build this up, we had some positives, but Derek, if you had to rate this game, what would your rating be for it? For me, there's some other solid platformers in that era that I just prefer. This one is like a 7 out of 10 for me. A lot of fun, really great. But like I said, Super Mario 64. It could have just been my age. Spyro was great for my little brother at the time. Um, so maybe he would give this a higher rating or, or people of his age would. But for me, like a 7 out of 10, what about you? I mean, if I had to give it a rating, like you said, it's it was a platformer that definitely pushed the boundaries. I wasn't a Sony kid, but going back and retrospectively playing it, I do enjoy it. I do enjoy Super Mario 64 a lot more. I just think Super Mario 64 and then the, the subsequent Marios that followed that feature of like Super Mario Sunshine into like Mario Odyssey have some of like the cleanest movements and jump mechanics and just things that like you and I as kids never really perfected or like used some of the jumps. And like, I watched speedrunners. I'm like, I didn't even know there was a jump in the game. That's insane. <laughs> so it, it, yeah. I think the movement was just so much cleaner on those. But if I had to give it a rating, I would give it sheeps against spyro.com. Go ahead and check that website out today. Uh, you guys are <laughs> wonderful. Check it out. Out of 10. Nice. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I, I think a little bit of that has to do with the, I think, the four legs. He's a little stiffer. I haven't played the the trilogy, the remastered or remade, whatever it reignited. is. Reignited. Um, but, yeah, reignited, sure. And um, uh, But I remember Spyro from those original games, mm-hmm. and it, it just feeling a little stiff comparatively with the, the larger body, yeah. essentially. Um, but yeah, you know, that's just nature of the character. Still a really great game and fun episode. Absolutely. Research for this episode was done by Alex Kendall and Derek Baker. The intro and outro music was given to us by our friend Evan Barr, and our lovely artwork was provided by Aaron Shattuck. Beautiful people. Also want to thank the beautiful people over on our Patreon. You can check us out at patreon.com slash finish the fight to support us monetarily. I want to thank a few select members today with Snide T. Bird, Nick Hyman, and Anthony Gooch. Thank you so much for your support. You can find this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or most likely your favorite podcast listening platform. If you haven't yet, please drop us a review. It helps us out a lot. We'd love to hear from you. And if you are listening on Spotify as well, 
There are Q and A's for every episode, or we could just get a little bit of feedback from you guys on the content of the episode. What do you think about the games? What do you think about the eras? It all just depends on the question. You know, go ahead and shoot us a response there, and uh, maybe your response will get published. Absolutely. And you can check us out over on Twitch. You can see me at twitch.tv slash sourman70. That's twitch.tv slash S-O-U-R-M-A-N-7-0. As well as Derek at twitch.tv slash thebakerman247. That is twitch.tv slash thebakerman247. You can follow this podcast on Instagram and Twitter. We are also on Discord. It's free to join. There's a link in the description below, and we would love to see you there. And with that, that has been our coverage of Spyro the Dragon. Are there any other retro series that you think deserve the coverage? Do you think there's a better platformer or a better dragon game than Spyro? Let us know on our social channels, and we will try and write an episode featuring your choice. And as always, I am your host, Alex Kendall. And I am your host, Derek Baker. And this has been Finish the Fight a gaming podcast. <laughs>